At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts. Number one, vertigo is a fascinating disorder picking up the, all the vertiginous patients in toto or in partial. Example for easy understanding for the postgraduates, if you look at the finger, you know the etiology of the nervous system and in particular any diseases, particularly vertigo. A, if you look at the thumb, that is the T, is trauma toxic tumor. Index finger in, represents infections, viral, bacterial, syphilitic, HIV, etc. See the middle finger M, metabolic, both diabetes and as well as renal and liver functions. Everybody wants to have a diamond ring finger, so D, degeneration and demyelination. And little finger, little flow or absent flow, vascular causes. Hand, H is hereditary and ND is nutritional disorders. This sums up the etiology of the vertigo. I would like to just pass over for a five minutes how I see a vertigo patient and then come to the literature. Number one, if a patient comes to me with vertigo, is it true or false? Make him lie down in the floor if the vertigo persists, true vertigo. If it doesn't, exception, an exception to this rule is alcohol and drugs. He does have vertigo even in the sitting, lying posture. If it is a true vertigo, then we have the three vision. which has already been beautifully highlighted. You have the mistake in the eye. You have the mistake in the ear or you have in the mistake in the neck. It is the traditional meeting point or a melting point of neurologists and the neurosurgeons and then the neurophysicians and above all the ENT people. That it is the cervical spondylosis, that is the time honored concept which is going to go to the cast of vertigo. It is a proprioceptive input that arises from the neck muscles which is the real origin for the mismatch of the impulses in the brain. So cervical spondylosis is not per se, but it is a proprioceptive input of the neck muscles. B, the vision, and C, you have the most important is the ear. Now coming back to the ear, I always feel that if you look at the patient with vertigo, having its true vertigo, next I ask the simple questions. A, does he have a perioral numbness? B, double vision? C, tinnitus and wet hearing deficit? Nasal regurgitation? Weakness? Clumsiness? and as well as sensory deficit. All these spines plus minus, you put it, and if it is positive along with vertigo, it's unlike to be peripheral. It can be in combination or it can be in isolation. If it is going to be an isolated vertigo, unless proved otherwise it's peripheral. Exception to this rule is cerebellar infarct and as well as an isolated brainstem ischemia, which is very rare in private practice. B, the incidence of posterior circulation syndrome in general public at large is 10 to 20 percent. That means 80 percent of the strokes are anterior. So when you get a case of vertigo alone, have this in the thought process so that you will be able to come to conclusion reasonably. The second step is over. The second, third step is the infection. Does he have upper respiratory, lower respiratory, gastrointestinal infection? People are all very fond of crabs, crabs and prawns. Watch out. Private practice, you just get the vertigo within 48 hours. You can have a neurological deficit, you can have a numbness, you can have weakness, above all vertigo. So the diet important, infection is important, the drug is important. If you have this column, five columns put up, then you know reasonably where you are. Once having fixed this, now comes a classical problem. You have is a vertigo is just a, denotes a hallucinatory sensation of movement. Balance the imbalance by the ENT or the neurologist. You must always balance the imbalance in our thinking too. What is the prevalence? Of course, it has been beautifully brought out by my previous speaker and the contradictory information which he has already dealt it nicely. Of course, the types of dizziness, we can call it any name, but it just comes in the vernacular of the particular people from which they come from. Sites of vertigo, this is a, one of the older concepts where if it is only in the ear, it's called it peripheral vertigo. In between the vestibular nerve, it's called it intermediate and finally the central vertigo. The causes of peripheral vertigo, this is for easy purpose with the practical angle. If it is a peripheral, which has been dealt beautifully by him, if it is an intermediate one where there is a merger of the central and peripheral, where you have vestibular neuronitis, acoustic neuroma and drugs, whereas the central vestibular causes are usually the posterior circulation syndrome, arteriosclerosis, cervical spondylosis, whiplash, brain tumors. Then what are the non-vestibular causes which you have been dealing about? Of which I want to just say anemia and orthostatic hypertension, cerebrovascular disorders, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, hypoglycemia and migraine, 
where the comorbidity of the migraine and then the vertigo is now being increasingly talked about. <laughs> then you have the other central nervous system causes. You have the classification of vertigo per se has undergone revolutions. We said it's a paroxysmal vertigo. Sudden attack comes and kick lasts for a short time, which has been dealt beautifully. The single attack or a chronic vertigo and above all positional and disease spells. The diagnosis of vertigo, which I have already dealt it now, description, classification, influencing circumstances, and finally the secondary symptoms. The postural tests that we can be clinically do it are Romberg, Uttenberg, Babinsi, Barony, and eye movements. These are all very classical for all the people. It will be carrying coal to Newcastle's in this August audience. I just go through this test. But the most important thing is the clinical point is the nystagmus. I look at the patient whether he has nystagmus or no nystagmus. If the nystagmus is not present and if the eyes are closed and if it shows nystagmus likely to be periphery. This is only a clue. This is a guideline. It's not absolute. It doesn't fall under the one SD deviation. It all falls between 2 SD and 3 SD. The chances are that you will error about in one tenth of the cases. If the nystagmus is present in eyes closed, nystagmus is present the moment the eye is closed, no nystagmus likely to be a central disorder. The nystagmus is present and the eye is closed and then the also the nystagmus perfis only problem. These are the cases in which you have either it's a peripheral or central. The induced nystagmus, of course, is a positional and positioning nystagmus. So comes the point of differentiation between the two. Of all the points that have been described in the world literature, the one thing that is definitely present, which we always use is, if there is a lag, likely to be, there is immediately starting central. Vertigo purely present, never present, and maybe. All these things are all statistical. And I always remembered of Professor Blau's statement, statistics is the paralysis of your analysis. But without statistics, there is no meaningful correlation either. You can never get married to either extremes, in which case you are not going to really get the real the bullseye. So when you look through the peripheral and central, we always say, if there is going to be a fast component towards the right side, it could mean A, cerebellar on right side, or B, it could be a vestibular lesion on the left side. In a given single case, you always have this confusion, whether this or that in an isolated syndrome without any long track symptoms or signs. But if you remember, the common causes are usually demyelinating. In peripheral lesions, infection is a cause, vascular and aplasm in the central vestibular process. Having understood the basic mechanisms, now comes the classification of the different areas of the, especially the vestibular nerve and pedinclopontane nucleus and as well as PPRF. Prepontine reticular formation, the one golden rule that everybody should remember is a vestibular nuclei is controlling the opposite PPRF. This point must be made into mind so that you will be able to describe much better. Now, when it comes to the common causes, you have the current classification approaches in the central causes as episodic ataxia, benign recurrent vertigo, bilateral vestibulopathy, vertigo, migraine and essential trauma, and familial audio-vestibular dysfunction and menias disease. Now, if you look at the episodic ataxias, the commonest, of course, you see is EA2. Sometimes the differentiating point, if you look at it, you have a clear-cut picture of dysarthria and as well as dementia coming. But if you remember, most of them are dominant. Usually, the weakness is present in EA2, which is absent in EA1 in EA2. So I go by the three clinical signs between differentiating between the EA1, 2 and 3, namely the weakness. The dysarthria, if it is present, it could either be a EA2 or EA3, but the distinguishing feature is the weakness. If the dysarthria is present, then we know it is EA2 and 3. And next step, if he has a weakness, then it clearly tells us that it is 100% a probability of EA2. Because most of this episodic ataxia syndrome presents, and if you look at it, it lasts from seconds to minutes, EA1, so BPV also EA1. So in that patient, we don't, we have to look into the EA1 ataxias. If you look at it hours and minutes, then it comes under the vestibular neuronitis. See, that is where, statistically speaking, the merger of all the specialists and be a vertigo syndrome, people should consist of all the people so that we don't miss, rather we don't miss the forest looking out for a tree. 
So you have a complete analysis of the symptoms and only when you do the ep episodic ataxia syndromes of all the types there are so far till date seven episodic ataxia syndromes have been described. The acute peripheral vestibular the last period of one to three days, brainstem lesion near the vestibular nuclei, frequent and severe vertigo attacks accompanied by nausea and vomiting, severe benign paroxysmal positioning vertigo, prevention of more sickness, central positioning and vomiting. This, these are the chapters I have just named it. The entire sky is really now coming under the purview of the saccades and oculomotor adaptation. If you look, most of the international literature which have come from are all from the saccades and as well as from the adaptation, including the role of forward models in the saccades and the behavioral models. There are three reflexes which have been described of which especially the vestibular cochlear and the vestibular ocular reflexes have been well studied in the neurophysiology. The other two reflexes are not well studied neurophysiologically. If you look at what is the second point, one is of course we have already seen is the episodic ataxias. The second point which when we are seeing clinically with a vertigo of a central origin, either it can be a downbeat nystagmus or it can be an upbeat nystagmus. This downbeat nystagmus is a solid clinical sign when you look at it and ask him to look at a lateral gaze and if the nystagmus is going to increase in its intensity and as well as in the downward gaze then you know you are dealing with the downbeat nystagmus. Downbeat nystagmus is not the characteristic feature of a particular disease. It can come in a degenerative problem like cerebellar disorders, either ischemic or idiopathic variety, or it can also come associated with the bilateral vestibular pathy, where we have not yet fully understood the mechanism, but it can present with downbeat nystagmus. Downbeat nystagmus is classically what we call it as a slow drift upwards with a brisk downwards movement which is always seen in the clinical bedside which we call velocity you can decide all these particular conditions. If you have an upbeat nystagmus where the slow drift downwards with a brisk upwards which is an upbeat nystagmus you look at a clinical point in the patient and you notice the site of lesion is usually in the medulla or pons or as well as in the mesencephalic part of the reticular system and usually the cause is either ischemic or bleeding. Very rarely the eye sign is indicating the vernicosencephalopathy. So you look at it and then that sign if it is present, the upbeat nystagmus has come into the clinical parlance. These patients when they have either downbeat nystagmus or an upbeat nystagmus, both of them they can have associated with vestibulopathy conditions, associated with the degenerative conditions, associated with the cervical medullary junction abnormality, it can be associated with the tumors, it can be associated with the vascular ischemic lesions. So once you see this nystagmus then you know that it is of a central origin, it may be associated with a definite evidence of vertigo in them. Now lastly people have come to the another terminology in the world is called vestibular paroxysmia. This VP is a process of exclusion. When you have to exclude all the three benign disorders, especially BPV, vestibular neuronitis and menias, it also really does not take into account the Dehiscent syndrome, somatoform vertigo disorders and it doesn't pick up the peripheral disorders and the central disorder as a whole. But nonetheless, for want of literature, especially re repetition, you have to have this vestibular paroxysmia which originally called vascular compression and of the particular vessels. Cochlear artery is a very hairline artery and when it supplies that it can produce real problems. So that is the reason why they are now coming up with this term. I do not know how the, the literature with the ENT people and the neurologists are going to agree on this. There are already different discussions on this paroxysm, especially paroxysmia, vestibular paroxysmia. Now, the management consists of essentially adaptation exercises, surgery. Of course, it's essentially to fewer attacks every month. Attacks should not be bad as before. Attacks should be not lost long. anti veterinary drugs, sky is the limit. More the drugs, that means less we understand. We have used all the drugs and still we are at a lurking point. And immediately think of the site of action and anti virtuous drugs. Labyrinthine is a diuretic and corticosteroids, blood flow is vasodilators, reticular formation sympathomimetics, reticular formation antiemetic, antiemetic, anticholinergics and as well as GABAmonergic suppression. If you look at the whole, either you have the GABA A, GABA A agonist or your GABA B agonist. GABA B, B and go with beta histine, A with A is goes for C, choline. So you can use it any drug but the 
only thing is the patient's perseverance with the patient results in a success of the story. There is an interesting point that can we do with Sinerazine. A word of uh, a note about the Sinerazine and Flonerazine. You don't get extra pyramidal syndrome as an idiopathic, idiosyncratic reaction to Sinerazine and Flonerazine. You get it only on a long term use over a period of months and years, not when you use it for weeks and years. Prochlorazine has a much more drug which can cause as an acute extra pyramidal manifestation including dystonic or opisthotonic or as a matter of fact long drawn dean extra pyramidal system disturbance. Now anxiolytics value of it is really undergone a change it helps the patient endures the patient by allowing the anxiety but not touching the vertiginous component. Many side effects are noticed including drowsiness and sedation and dependence on the absence potentials that is the abuse potential and psychomotor impairment. Frusamide and hydrochlorothiazide, I don't have to tell you, it increases the uric acid, it increases the sugar, hyperuremia, hyperuricemia, but nonetheless it is used in vertigo and meniere diseases caution. Reduce the volume of endolymph for promoting the urine flow and reducing the fluid retention. Mainly associated with the electrolyte imbalance. Of course we have discussed about this, the beta histine is therapy, trusted therapy for more than 41 vertigo patients, of course it has already been dealt by him. And the clinical studies with the pharmacological angle of course been dealt with increases the cochlear flow, firing frequency of the vestibular nuclei and the lesser vestibular ocular asymmetry score with beta histine treatment. Higher degree of vestibular compensation, faster recovery with beta histine. When there was a global evaluation done, you find the efficacy, tolerance and associated symptoms. We always use, whenever a drug is used, to find out the di diagnostic and therapeutic efficiency, Rodin has already given a classical definition. Number of times the drug was used and number of times it was useful into 100. If it gives you more than 75 primary and tertiary care treatment. If it is between 35 and 75, it should be used in research methods. If it is less than 35, it's a placebo response. Because any drug, when it is given in your hand, if you have confidence in the patient and the doctor have the absolute relationship, immediately the nelarfin and endorphin system is activated, periacutical gray secretes this hormone, results either in the pain relief or in as well as the symptom relief. So anybody who reports 30% relief, watch out with caution because you, will be, you should not be fooled by rats. The highlights of the trial of the first Indian trial was done specifically with 16 milligram TID dose focus in the insight in the management of acute cases is therapy. Thanks to sir, you have, have used this and especially they have found that there is a definite HPO trans image of the brain from Hinduja Hospital Mumbai. The top row you can show the hypoperfusion on the left temporal lobe prior to therapy and the bottom row shows the particular patient with the complete normalization of perfusion within after four weeks of beta injection therapy in 16 ways. If you use the same way the SPECT and as well as the MRI, the top row images show the hyperperfusion in the right inferior cerebellar region prior to therapy, whereas the bottom row shows images almost a complete normalization of perfusion. You will also notice the top row showing the well-defined localized hyperperfusion in the right parieto-occipital region prior to therapy and the bottom row show classically almost complete normalization of perfusion in three weeks after beta histine therapy. So what is the comparison between the two? There is no drowsiness, facilitates compensation suitable for use with the vestibular therapy, habituation therapy. So no extra pyramidal side effects, effects on long term, no anti-dopaminergic side effects, no caution required in the elderly. So no caution is, of course you have to have a, no it's written as no caution, you take the hypotension. We have had one or two patients. Bertin increases the alertness and as well as no effect on the driving performance. Efficacy, safety, facilitates, no drowsiness suitable with vegetable habituation therapy. Assured patient complaints, convenient dosage and established. 48 is ideal and it should be given two doses per day. There are some differentiation points. Always I say never be the first man to use the drug nor use the dosage nor be the last man to try the dose on the drug. See it's always in between because you will always fail in the statistical data because whenever you do a larger study you come into statistical type 2 error. Now the management is predominantly vestibular habituation therapy where adaptation, habituation, con compensation I should not carry cold to Newcastle's in ENT people. And I always say efficacy of the group between the two exercises, exercises, exercise. It is the exercise that is going to give us a success with various exercises have been delivered to the public at large. 
and you will notice here it is the exerciser that is going to give him the balance and as well as standing position and as well as continue with exercises in standing while walking exercise in upping down and playing any game involving bending and stretches because I don't want to go through this full exercises pattern I said exercises are the, usually the rule so in a nutshell whenever I see the patient I simply ask them if you remember the alphabets of A to Y you know what are the causes of course you have to think A mentions alcohol and age age are disorders of the gait and elderly and falls B stands for blood pressure and as well as beta jarda C stands for cigarette and as well as for coronary artery disease D stands for diabetes mellitus the drugs and as well as other habituating drugs E stands for elevated cholesterol triglyceride and uric acid F stands for females of disrepute G ganja and other drugs H indicates homocysteine and hypothyroid status and I includes injury to the skull brain nerve infection and as well as in inflammatory problem commonest causes if you are not having going to have A to I you are a J jolly person without wet I go thanks to my alma mater professor B Ramamurthy who created the institution thank you very much